Hey, physical science students, and welcome to our lecture on states of matter. So, um, what are states of matter? Uh, the ones most of us have heard of are solids, liquids, and gases. Um, and the picture we're looking at is a good one to start with because um, in this picture, which is from Yellowstone National Park, we actually have water in all three states. Um, it's found as a liquid in the stream, it's found as a solid in the snow and ice surrounding this stream, and you see water vapor rising off the water here. So it's found in all three states. And an interesting note about water, water is actually the only substance that we know of that's found in all three states under normal circumstances in nature, under normal atmospheric conditions. So uh, yeah, that's pretty interesting. So what is uh, solid liquids and gases? Well, from junior high science, we should know that um, solids in general um, are, uh, they're rigid, they maintain their shape, um, they're generally more dense. We'll talk more about that in a second. Uh, liquids are a little bit less dense. They're able to flow. Um, they take the shape of the container they're in, and gases then are even more able to move and flow. And they spread out. Gases actually spread out to fill whatever space they're in. So no matter how big the space is, a gas will expand to fill it. <clears throat> but what's different about these uh, substances at an atomic or molecular level? Well, all substances are made of either atoms or molecules. So if you're talking about something like uh, helium gas, it would just be made of atoms. Uh, water is made of molecules. Each molecule is H2O, which means it has two hydrogens and one oxygen in a molecule. Um, and these things uh, behave as a molecule would behave just like one atom would. So we're going to draw these things up here. So let's say we had a solid. Um, in a solid, what's going on is that uh, these atoms are locked in place. Um, they are attracted to each other and they form bonds between each other that hold themselves in place. Now, they still have energy and they're still moving, so they're actually vibrating in place. And I can represent that with these little arrows right here. So these, uh, all these atoms would be vibrating, but they don't have enough energy, enough kinetic energy to break those bonds and therefore start moving around. And that's what gives a solid its rigid nature. Now, as you heat it up, as you heat something up, it gains kinetic energy. These things start vibrating faster and faster and faster until that energy begins to be enough to actually break those bonds. And then um, these atoms can start to move around each other. So um, they still are attracted to each other. They still can't just go anywhere. That's why a, a liquid will stay in the container it's in. But it changes shape because these things can move around each other. Um, all these atoms here are freer to start uh, sort of moving around and past each other even though they're still connected to each other. So there's more movement here going on in a liquid. And then as you heat them up even more, they um, stop being attracted to each, well not stop being attracted to each other, but they actually break all those attractions and completely take off on their own. Um, and so a gas is much less dense, they're more spread out, and uh, are traveling independently of the other molecules. So as you heat something up, it'll eventually go from a solid to a liquid to a gas. And so gases generally have more kinetic energy than solids. Okay, so a simple image here. You would see the more dense, rigid solid here, and here the atoms would just be vibrating in place um, again, they're not stopped, they're still moving and vibrating, but it's not enough to break the bonds. Here, they are a little less dense, and they're actually um, able to move past each other and slide past each other. And finally, in this last one, the gas, they're much more spread out and moving independently of it, one another. Uh, one more reason water is kind of a weird substance, it's the only substance in the world we know, know of, where the uh, solid is actually less dense than the liquid. So let's talk about that. So the reason ice floats on water is the solid of water is actually less dense than the liquid and that's again this is the only substance we know of that really does this um, so um, this is really important otherwise lakes would freeze from the bottom up the ice would sink to the bottom and we couldn't probably have life in our oceans or our lakes so why is that um, turns out that the um, a water is a uh, so what we call a polar molecule it has an oxygen with two hydrogens and the oxygen pulls harder on electrons, electrons than the hydrogens do, so it gets a partial negative charge. And the hydrogens, because the electrons are pulled away from them, get a partial positive charge. 
Um, this makes uh, the positively charged hydrogens of one molecule attracted to the negatively charged oxygens of another, and they start forming what we call these hydrogen bonds. So again, the negative oxygen of this molecule is attracted to the positive uh, hydrogen of that one, and the negative oxygen of this one is attracted to the positive hydrogen of this one, and so it actually gets this really orderly crystalline structure like you see in this bubble here. So um, you'll see uh, oxygens attracted to hydrogens and hydrogens attracted to oxygens, and it actually causes them to spread out just a little bit, so ice is slightly less dense than water. In a liquid, though, we break those bonds and they start moving around each other. They're less orderly, so they're a little closer together. And then as it boils, we form a gas. Um, and again, the gas is much uh, less dense than either of the other two. All right, let's watch a quick video of this, because I think it's the best way I can um, explain this stuff. So um, here we go. We're looking at a solid. Um, we're going to cool this down until this forms a solid. So you can see these things, they're still vibrating. The water molecules are vibrating in place, um, but they are locked together. So this would be basically an ice cube of water. Again, each uh, molecule you'll see in there uh, consists of one oxygen and two hydrogens. And you'll see why ice is less dense than water. It's these bonds between the molecules force them to spread out. Well, I'm going to start adding some heat and we'll see what happens. So as I start adding some heat, they vibrate faster and faster until some of them start to break those bonds that are holding them in that crystal structure. Okay, so now we're starting to approach a water. Now these things can kind of freely move around each other. They're still kind of stuck to each other, um, so they're not taking off on their own just yet, but they can move around and change their position and move past each other. This is a liquid. And then if we heat it any, even more, these atoms start breaking these bonds all together and spreading out across this container. And so now it would be boiling, and now we're starting to get a gas. And these things will take off completely on their own, independently of the other molecules, and spread out a whole bunch. And this would be the gaseous state of water. All right, back to our PowerPoint here. Um, there actually is one more thing that affects um, what state of matter you're in, and that's pressure. So uh, this is what we call a triple point graph or a phase change graph. And um, this shows increasing pressure on the y-axis and increasing temperature on the x-axis. So at any given pressure, for example, let's say we're right here, it would be a solid. And let's say this is a pressure of one atm, one atmosphere right here. And as you increase the temperature, as you hit this line, this would be the melting point. It would melt from a solid to a liquid. And then once you pass that, you're a liquid. And as you continue increasing the temperature, eventually you hit the boiling point, which would be right here. And once you get past the boiling point, you've got a gas. So anywhere higher temperature than this, and you have a gas. But you could also leave something at a constant temperature, let's say right here. And let's say this is a temperature of 120 degrees Celsius, maybe. Okay, which would have me at a gas if this was uh, water. But let's say I started increasing the pressure, and this pressure was pushing these molecules closer and closer and closer together until eventually if the pressure got high enough, this would actually become a liquid again. Um, so uh, increasing the pressure tends to make something go from a gas to a liquid to a solid. So something that would normally be a liquid, if you put it under a really high pressure, it might actually compress it till it was a solid. If there is something that was a uh, gas, if you compress it enough, it might actually become a liquid. Um, this is also why water boils at a lower temperature when you're at a high elevation. The pressure is lower at a high elevation. And so uh, you can see here that if I lower the pressure here to less than an atmosphere, this temperature right here, this boiling temperature, would be less than the boiling temperature up here at a higher uh, pressure. So um, that's why water boils where we're at here in Phillipsburg um, at, say, maybe 96 degrees Celsius instead of 100 degrees Celsius. Um, one more thing about water. Water is also weird here. Um, remember, liquid water is one of the only substances that's more dense 
than uh, solid water. So if you increase the pressure on an ice cube, it's actually going to melt it instead of make it a solid. So most substances, that's not true. If you increase the pressure, it would become a solid. But because water is special and the liquid is more dense than the solid, as you increase the pressure, it would actually melt. This is the effect you get when you have an ice cube. If you kind of squeeze it between, between your teeth, it'll actually melt a little faster. Okay, finally, another thing I should mention is although uh, usually we just teach students about three states of matter and everybody talks about the three states of matter, solid, liquid, and gas, there's actually several other states of matter, including plasma, a very weird state of matter called a Bose-Einstein Bose condensate, and some other ones that we're not going to really learn about right now, but there are more than just three states of matter. Um, but one I really want to talk about um, is plasma. Okay, and why would I talk about plasma, um, which is a... Uh, fourth state of matter, I guess. Well, I would talk about pl plasma because it's actually the most common state of matter in the whole universe. In fact, probably 99% of all matter and maybe more is plasma, not solid liquids or gases. We don't tend to think that way because on Earth, most substances are either a solid, a liquid, or a gas. But uh, plasma is even more common. So what is a plasma? A plasma is a state where a gas actually becomes, uh, has gets so much energy that it loses its electrons. So you remember most atoms have a nucleus with protons which are positively charged and neutrons in the middle and we have electrons orbiting around this nucleus at different energy levels and that would be an atom. Well what happens in a plasma is this atom actually gets so much energy that these electrons break free of the nucleus and move about on their own. And we call that ionization. And so uh, we call a gas that this has happened to an ionized gas. So again, what that means, all the atoms in the gas have lost their electrons. So our sun, this is a picture of our sun right here. The sun is mostly plasma. Um, these gases are so hot that they have ionized, they've lost their electrons, and the electrons move around separately from their nucleus, the protons and neutrons. Um, and so, because most of the visible universe actually is stars, and stars hold most of the mass in the universe, most of the matter in the universe is actually in the form of plasma. But plasma isn't uh, all that unfamiliar to you. You've actually seen it a whole bunch in your life. Um, here's some examples. Uh, the northern lights that you see, or the aurora borealis, the colors in the sky, um, that's plasma. That's what happens when uh, basically rays from the sun um, excite electrons uh, in our atmosphere and in our uh, magnetosphere, which means the magnetic field that protects the Earth, and it excites these gases to the point that they lose their electrons. When they lose their electrons, they give off um, different wavelengths of light, which is why we get these cool light shows. Um, you may have seen a plasma ball. This is a plasma ball and uh, it's got electric current traveling out to the outside of this glass here and that electric current excites electrons they leave the uh, atoms and you get the colors as a result so what the light you see is plasma um, more examples include lightning so when a huge electric bolt passes through the air um, it again excites them uh, causes them to ionize and we get plasma which is what you see as a lightning bolt uh, this is a plasma TV which uses gases and little uh, bulbs inside the TV and when we run electric current through them they light up and that's what gives our screen the very uh, nice image. Uh, any uh, neon signs is actually a form of plasma. There's gases inside these things and when electric current runs through it ionizes them and creates plasma. And fluorescent lights, either this energy efficient bulb or the lights in your classroom are also um, plasma when we run electric current through them and they uh, electron or sorry the atoms lose their electrons and it becomes plasma so again the most common states of matter solid liquid and gas have to do with, with temperature and pressure um, of the substance um, but there are more states of matter than just that there's plasma and there's also some other strange ones out there if you're interested go look up Bose Einstein condensate on YouTube all right that's it for today. Um, we'll see you guys next time.